All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Frontline Bible Church. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. Happy Father's Day to everyone out there. Yeah, so glad you could join us and be here with us uh, on Father's Day. Um, uh, by the way, if anyone is happening to be visiting this morning, we want to give you an extra special welcome. Uh, we are so glad that you're here, that you decided to stop by. And if you are visiting, uh, we would love the opportunity to get connected with you better. Uh, for that reason, we have these uh, connection cards which are located in the back of the seat in front of you, as well as uh, if you return that to the information center, then we'll be able to give you uh, one of these blue Frontline Cups as a gift for stopping by. So that's pretty great. Um, also, just as always, want to welcome those who are watching over Facebook Live and a special uh, Happy Father's Day to you out there in the cyber world. <laughs> so, um, if, if I can this morning, I just want to uh, open in prayer. Why don't you all stand up with me? God, we are so glad on this Father's Day to recognize you as our perfect Father. We know that people come from all sorts of different backgrounds, and, uh, you know, some of us maybe didn't even have the best fathers, or maybe didn't have a father at all growing up, um, maybe uh, bad fathers, uh, and maybe good fathers, and, uh, and we thank you, God, for the opportunity to just simply have life, and we recognize that you are our good and perfect father with an amazing love for us that you had such a love for us that you were willing to lay down uh, the life of, of your precious son, Jesus. And we pray, God, that we would have that same sort of sacrificial love for the people around us. That those of us who are fathers would be willing also to lay down our lives uh, for our wives and even uh, in some regard for our children also. Help us, each one of us, to love each other as members of the same family, that we all share the same father. And so, God, we recognize you for your incredible love for us this morning. Thank you, God. Would you please join with me in singing How Deep the Father's Love? How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch's treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which bar the chosen one bring many sons to
have paid my ransom. And I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of Perfect in all of your ways. You are 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 perfect
Thank you, God, for being so perfect, for being a wonderful Father to us. Uh, fathers on this earth may uh, sometimes overreact, um, sometimes uh, cause problems or fights and so forth. Uh, hopefully not all the time, but but we know you, God, that you are perfect, that even though you do discipline us, you do not do it in wrath or in anger, but in perfect love. That you would see us become more and more like your precious son, Jesus. That your discipline would lead us to godly sorrow, which would lead to repentance. That we would turn away from sin and be brought into greater and greater holiness. That we would be made closer and closer into the image of your precious son, Jesus. So we thank you, God, for tenderly taking care of us. Thank you for adopting us into your family. Thank you for the example that you give us, that we would follow that example. And those of us who are fathers would also be become greater examples of the perfect father that we have in you. Good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. Dear presence to cheer and 
things in the scriptures. Of course, it is a, written by God, by His Holy Spirit, who is our perfect guide to life. It tells us a lot about the nature of God. And one thing we read about uh, Jesus is that He is God, that he, by Him all things were made, and without Him was not anything made that has been made. And that because he gave his life on our behalf, although he was God, he became man and gave his life on our behalf. And because of this, he was given the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We also read that we have been given the very mind of Christ, that we would somehow participate in his example of obeying God, of humbling himself, of laying down his life on behalf of us, that we would have his love among us. We know that we cannot love but for the fact that we have been born of God and that we share in His love. So as we sing this song, let's remember how worthy, how holy, how mighty, and above everything God is, and yet also how near to us and how His love empowers us also to love each and every one who is a part of this family of God and even those who are outside of it. Let's sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Thank you for your love, which is a firm foundation for us. Thank you that we can put our trust completely in you, knowing that you will not let us down. Although sometimes things turn out different than we may suppose things ought to go, we know, God, that you are in control of all things. 
and that you as our perfect Father are doing everything according to your perfect will for us. Uh, we know in the scriptures that uh, it says, uh, Jesus says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father. That if we were to hear our own children ask for uh, fish, as it says, we would not give them a stone. Or if they were to ask for bread, we would not give them a serpent. <laughs> so we thank you, God, that you are that much more perfect than we are. That your love is perfect for us. That your plan is perfect. And that you see things so perfectly. Help us to become more and more like you each day. Loving, forgiving, encouraging, and showing this world a little bit more what do you look like as we roam around as your body on this earth. We thank you, God, for all that you do for us. And I praise you and thank you in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Why don't you please have a seat? Uh, at this point, if you are uh, three years old through kindergarten, you are dismissed for Children's uh, Church. So go ahead and follow the, the crowd there, and uh, you can f find your way to your classrooms. If you are uh, a member here, uh, then you already know what I'm about to tell you, which is uh, to, uh, if you come regularly, you can participate in giving by uh, using the giving boxes by each one of the doors or online at frontlinebible.com as well as the Easy Tithe uh, app, and you can also set up automatic payments and so forth, which is really convenient, uh, which is what I do. Uh, another thing, for if you, if you have been coming here a long time, uh, you may or may not realize that we made you a mailbox. Um, not everybody, but if you have been coming for a while, you probably have a mailbox, and it is probably overflowing. So make sure you stop by and visit it. The location of the mailboxes is between the lobby and the multi-purpose room. There's a little hallway in between there, and there's mailboxes. And if you've been coming for a while, there's probably a mailbox with your name on it, and it's probably filled with stuff that you haven't seen in quite a while. So why don't you go ahead and pull those things out, check your mailboxes, and take what belongs to you, uh, because we like to communicate with you in that way. Okay, at this point, uh, Pastor John's going to come up and give us the word this morning. Woohoo! All right, good morning. Uh, I want to have a question for you. When I say the word family, if I say the word family, what is the first word that comes to your mind? Dis dysfunctional. I heard that over there. Okay, dysfunctional. <laughs> what's another word that might come to mind? Love. Okay, what's another one? Thanksgiving. You mean you're thankful for them or... That's the only time your family gets together. Okay, that's the only, okay, all right. What else? When you hear the word, thank, or not the word Thanksgiving. When you hear the word family, what do you hear? Everyone. Everyone's your family? I love that. What's that? A tribe. Commitment, yeah. Mom and dad? What else? Cherish. Responsibility. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you to describe, if I say the word, the perfect family. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I distinctly remember last week, I think your family was relatively on the perfect scale. I think, I think. Okay, so the perfect family. What are words that come to your mind? Okay, I heard don't have one. What, what else comes to your mind? The reamers must. Impossible, okay. All right. Doesn't exist. Impossible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Cleaver family. How many of you would say that your family is perfect for you? 
How many of you say your family's perfect for you? Okay. How, how, for those who would say your family's perfect for you, how many of you would say that your family is perfect? Do you see there's a difference between something that is perfect for you and something that is perfect? You see, there is no such thing as the perfect family. Frankly, we'd have to go back and really probably change everybody's definition. What do we mean by the perfect family? But I'll tell you, for a lot of us here, your family is perfect for you. So much of this is because you and I are imperfect. And if our families were perfect, we better get out, right? We wouldn't fit anymore. But when I take my imperfections and my perfections, or my desire for perfections, maybe that's a better way of saying it, and I bring them together with my family's imperfections and their desire for perfection, for some strange reason, I get the perfectly imperfect family. I love my family. On a day like today, it's Father's Day. For some of you, your dads were awesome, are awesome. For some of you, mediocre. For others of you, sad to say, when the word father comes out, maybe even a tear comes to your eye. You didn't have the best dad. I don't know what your perception of Father's Day is, but it's only fitting that we're going to talk about family today. Here's the other thing, though. On a day like today, we're not going to talk about your biological family. We're going to talk about this thing called your church family. Now, I want you to describe something for me. I want you to describe, when, you, when I say the word church family, what comes to mind? Awesome. I'd agree with that. Community. What's some other words that come to mind? Commitment. What was that? Chosen. Ooh. Accountability. Accountability. Not everybody likes that. <laughs> Friendships. Diverse. Participation. Edification. Edification. All right. I, I have another one here. Okay, so we're going to change the gears, kind of like we do the family. I want you to describe the perfect church family. <laughs> uh, you can tell the man's on staff. Yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Perfect church family. What comes to mind? Loving. What was that? In heaven. In heaven. In heaven. Okay. A accepting. Two said at the same time. Yeah. You see. Is there such thing as a perfect church family? No. But I would like to make the same point. There may be a perfect church family for you. And what makes a family perfect for any one of us? You see, if only perfect people were allowed to go to church. All right, those who are not perfect, get up and leave right now. <laughs> we, we, we really should all go. Not a one of us is perfect. And, and yet, God has orchestrated and ordained that every single one of us is here today. And some are looking at me through that camera right now. Whatever it is, there's something about a family that even though we're imperfect, how many of you are imperfect here today? Even though we're imperfect, we can be perfectly imperfect for each other. That's what I want to talk about today. You see, here's the thing. We've been doing this series called uh, Designed to Connect. And we've been looking at Legos, okay? So we have this, uh, these Lego blocks that are illustrated up here. And the picture on the Lego blocks is each one of us, just like this Lego block, are designed to connect to each other. It's not much fun to just be a block. Like we talked about the first week, if I just gave you a Lego block for Christmas, 
Just one. And that's all you had. Thank you. I, I would feel that. Because I'm sure you would be like, oh, I've always wanted one Lego block. But then we start putting them together, and we start getting more and more, and next thing we know, we're building cool things because Legos are designed to connect. When I put it all together, it works. But like we talked about the first week, even though I'm designed to connect, Satan does not want me or you to be connected. Not at all. He wants us to be disconnected, and so he's constantly throwing things along, making me feel like I want to be by myself. And we talked about disconnection. Even though God designed us to connect, the perfect Garden of Eden, he designed us to connect in the beginning. Satan came along right at the beginning, and he ruined the whole thing. And we went from being designed to connect to we don't connect at all. We talked in there about some of the relational poverty that's experienced in our culture today. Because of increased mobility, because of convenience, because of busyness, because of whatever. People are feeling more relationally disconnected than maybe ever. We live in such a mobile society, like we've talked about. You see friends getting together nowadays, teenage friends. You see them getting together, they're sitting on the couch, and what are they all doing? They're not talking to each other. You know what they're doing? They're looking at their phones and they're texting. That's oftentimes what happens. Now there are times when maybe they're texting the person next to them because it's easier to talk to them that way. I don't know. But we live in a disconnected world. Satan wants us disconnected. Therefore, disconnection is a spiritual problem. So what God did, he said, I'm going to give you the best plan that I got. The best plan for bringing real connection back to the body of Christ or back to the world is, here's drum roll, please. Here's the drum roll. The best chance we have at this is, boom, the body of Christ. And it's like, yeah, I'm not really feeling that so much. Because you know what? I go to church. I go to Frontline Bible Church even. Heaven forbid. But you know what? We have a few people who deal, feel disconnected here at Frontline even. If that was the best plan, God, it's like, well, what chance do we have? Well, there was a problem. That's what we talked about last week. The real issue is because of this thing called sin. The reason why we struggle to disconnect even in the body of Christ is because of sin. And so it's only when we understand and really know God. The more I get to know the love of God and all that He has done for me, then it's, and then and only then can I really have something to offer. Once I know God, once I believe in Him and have received the love of Jesus Christ in my own life, then I have something to pass on to other people. It's not just a given that if I'm a part of the body of Christ, presto changeo, I'm a best connector ever. It doesn't work that way. And so today what I want to do is I want to give you a vision, hopefully. And I didn't dream this up. It's in the Bible, okay? I want to give you a vision of what it could be in the church. What it could be in the body of Christ. And not just the big body of Christ, because you know what? You're a part of a family that you didn't even choose. You're a part of a family all over this world. All over the world. The missionaries that we had come through here, even the ones who were from foreign countries, they came in and they talked about how, you know what, they pursue Jesus Christ, they follow Him, I do the same thing. They're my brothers and they're my sisters in Jesus Christ. It's so cool. i got family members everywhere. But I can't love all them equally. It's really hard to do community and do that with somebody who's halfway around the world. Shoot, it's, it's really hard to do community with people that live three blocks away from me. So how do we get to really feel connected as the body of Christ? And the way we get to do this is through the local church. It's through the local church. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, please. Paul, is my clicker working here? Is it up there? What? I don't see it in the back. I'm ruining my stuff already. All right, so there's the initial thing about the thing. I just didn't see it. Can you pull it up in the back, please, Paul? Colossians chapter 3 and verse... Whoops. There it is. Whoop. Go back. Okay, that's the one I want right there. So we'll just stop right there. Okay, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. All right. <clears throat> Paul.
Paul, the writer of this book, is writing to Christians. He's writing to people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. People, actually, who were a part of a local church. They were a part of a group of believers in the city called Colossae. Okay? It was a real city in a real time back in history. And so Paul, a real person, is writing a, a real letter to these people to encourage them and tell them. And they were having some struggles because of some false teachings that were going on. And so he was writing some things to clarify it. Okay? And so one of the things that he puts in here, verse 12, Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of, the, of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, I'll just point out a couple things. He's describing here what a people of God should be like. Compassionate. They feel for the pain of another. Just this morning, I got two different texts that came in from two people who are in unbelievable pain right now who attend Frontline Bible Church. And I, I can't give their stories or their names, but I'll tell you, my heart just broke for what they're dealing with on seemingly a daily basis. My heart just grieves for them. What would it be like if you had a family that you knew that no matter what you were going through, they felt with you? Maybe they can't change your situation, but you knew they felt with you. Maybe that's what you have here at Frontline. Maybe that's what you're longing for at a church. Kindness. Humility. You come to church, you come to a church family, and you don't feel looked down upon, you feel lifted up. You don't feel like people are judging you when you walk through the door. You feel like people are looking at you and saying, I am so glad you're here. What would that feel like? Has that been your experience with, with the local church? Or have you felt like when you walk through the doors, you've got people who are kind of staring down at you because maybe you don't dress like they do or talk like they do or smell like they do or whatever else. Gentleness. Patience. Boy, that word patience is just followed up with the word bear with one another. You know what the word bear with means? It's the picture of, of a horse, okay? Not, okay, okay. Work with me here for a second. It's the picture of a horse, and you put the saddle on the horse, but underneath the saddle of the horse, you stick something. And it's called a burr. So you stick a burr, and you say to the horse, pay no attention to that. It's not affecting me. Hopefully it's not affecting the horse. What's the horse going to do? He's going to be moving like, this thing is really irritating. Have you noticed this? That people in churches irritate each other sometimes? Shocking, I get it. People irritate each other. I would ask, how many of you have ever been irritated with me? But I may be not wanting to know that answer. So maybe it would be safer to say, ha, hey, Reamer's missing, please. I think it's pretty safe to say that probably for most of us here, we've been irritated by somebody next to us or around us at some point since being a part of Frontline, a local church. So even though we're designed to connect, we still have irritants and things. And so Paul is painting this picture. This is what the church could be like. Imagine a place where people are humble, patient, they bear with each other, they're compassionate, they're kind, they're gentle, they're all these things. This is what we could be. 
We forgive each other. Boy, I'll tell you. Have you ever been wounded by somebody in the local church? Have you ever been wounded by somebody at Frontline Bible Church? How hard is it to forgive that person sometimes? And yet, Paul says, we need to forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's what God has done. And so that's how we create this, this, this body. And over all these virtues, we put on love. And we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And the more we get to know what God has done for us, the more at peace I am with my brothers and my sisters. And I, in turn, can extend that. Even when somebody comes after me, I can still be gracious and extend peace back to them. Not because of something that I have, but because of something that I was given. Picture this. The Word of Christ is dwelling in them richly. It's the church family that gets together and they open up the Word and they spend time with this and they realize, you know what? If, if the Word needs to adjust to my life or I need to adjust to what the Word says, I'm going to adjust to the Word because we talk about it. We push each other. We teach and admonish one another. Boy, that word admonish, that's actually a hard word a little bit. Many of us come to church and we don't want somebody to tell us when we're doing maybe something wrong. But yet that's the concept of admonishing. I'm telling you, I need you to step up. That's the concept. With all wisdom, we're singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, with gratitude in our hearts. Can you imagine a Sunday morning when you come and, and there's songs of praise and worship and, and you look around and people are not sitting there like this. Not that that would ever happen at Frontline, I know that, but people aren't doing like this. People... Not to say everybody has to raise their hands, because not everybody does that, but, but you can just sense that even people who don't even like to sing, they're terrible at it. They're still making that joyful noise to God or something. I mean, that's the picture. And whatever they do, whether in word or in deed, they do it for the glory of God. Now that's a vision for the church. All right? Scale of 1 to 10. How close is Frontline Bible Church? Keep your score to yourself. You see, we ain't perfect. We don't do things right all the time. But I would bet that this body is perfectly imperfect for a lot of you. So we don't want to just stay there, though. We want to become more. And so today, hopefully, as we talk about this thing, a connection, hopefully as we go through this thing, we can get a couple images in our minds, images that may help us better understand how we can be even better at, at, at being a connector place for real people with real issues here at Frontline Bible Church. And so with that, I want to give you some images, okay? The first image looks like this. What is that? What's that? An emergency room. Where is the emergency room? They've commandeered the church. Uh, the first image that I want you to have is this. That the church is really a hospital. It's a hospital. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, please. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're not going to be working through a passage. We're going to be skipping around. So thank you for working with me on this. 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 12. Paul... The writer of this book is writing to a real person by the name of Timothy. And he was a young man. He was his mentee. Paul, Paul was the mentor. And he mentored young Timothy to be actually a pastor. And so at this point in time, he, Timothy was probably one of the lead pastors in the area of, of this region called Ephesus. Okay? It was a real city in time in modern-day Turkey. So Paul is writing to this young pastor who is struggling. He's, he's overwhelmed in some ways by ministry, and by the demands of ministry. And so Paul writes him this letter. And one of the things that he says here, verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. 
Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on Him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Can I get an amen, Paul says. As Paul outlines this whole thing, what he's saying is he's saying, I, I don't have my act all together. And, and God met me on the road to Damascus is what we find out. We find that out in the book of Acts. As Paul was going on and he was, had these murderous threats and he believed that anybody who was following after this man called Jesus, he believed that they deserved to die because they were disrupting the people of God, which was the nation of Israel. And they were disrupting it and they were following after Jesus. Well, what he didn't understand was that Jesus was the chosen Messiah. He was the one who had been promised to the nation of Israel that would deliver them, not just from Rome eventually and the tyr tyranny around them, but from their sins and all that stuff. And so they rejected him. But Paul says, no, I can't do this. And so God met him on the road. Before that, he had blasphemed the name of Jesus. Before that, he had been given his consent to kill other Christians, these followers of the way. And Paul says, man, he says, I look at this and he says, man, I am like the chief of sinners. I'm the worst of sinners. And yet God loves me. He's got unlimited patience with me. He actually says the words, unlimited patience. Let me tell you. He says, God did this to me to show me, so hopefully I can be an example to all of you that no matter where you're at, God is patient. And he says, I want this to be an example for anybody else you get to work with. And so he tells young Timothy, okay, young Timothy, you're going to deal with people who are going to need unlimited patience. And when you think that you're running out of patience, look at me, and this is the way that God sees me. How many people have come to church needing to be shown some patience and grace? How about you? Have you ever come to church needing some patience and grace? See, that's kind of what Paul's getting at here. There was a quote. It was written by the name of Kevin Lowe. He said this, Everyone is hiding something we can't see. Everyone is hiding something we can't see. If we were to have our lives and our thoughts, our feelings, everything turned inside out, how many of you are concerned maybe with what someone might see in your life? You see, here's the thing. Every one of us is in need of the healing power of the gospel in some aspect of our life. Not a one of us is somehow fixed. <laughs> I've arrived, you know, I'm now the pastor, I've arrived. No. Oh, thanks, Rang. I, I haven't arrived and I'm supposedly, supposedly, in a lot of people's minds, the guy closest to God here. I say supposedly. When, when I look at this, every single one of us, including myself, has areas of my life that I would rather not you not see, and you probably the same. Every single one of us needs a place that we can come and be given the healing power of the gospel. That's what the hospital does, right? But here's the thing that we see. I want you to turn in your Bible to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Okay, hopefully if you've been here any length of time, Galatians is well-worn, well-familiar to you in your Bibles because we spent a long time going through it. Galatians 6 was one of the last messages we gave out of the series, so I'm sure you have this part memorized. Galatians 6, verse 1. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. 
carry each other's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. It's talking about sin. It's talking about stuff that we realize, you know what, I'm not real happy about this. I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of sad about this. Maybe it wasn't even the sin that we did. Maybe it was the sin of somebody else who did things to us and we had no choice in the matter and yet it's affected us. And so to be able to come to the church, a place like this picture up here in which we recognize, boy, if you have emergencies, especially of the soul kind, come to church. Come. And when I say church, I mean a people. Okay, I don't mean this building here. On Mondays, through Fridays or Monday, whatever, oftentimes we'll have people here, but there's a lot of hours because during the nighttime there's nobody here. This place is just a building during that. When I talk about the church, I talk about people. And so when we say, you know what, you need, you need healing power of the gospel, come to the church, come to us. We want to help bring the gospel to all the areas of your life. God loves you, he's crazy about you. He can change your life. That's what we do. Here's what happens when we carry each other's burdens. First of all, there will, we realize, we find this out, there will always be somebody doing better than we are. You ever notice that? You go and you talk to somebody and you look at their life and you're like, how do they have it so good? What did I do to deserve the life I got? When we carry each other's burdens, when we, when we say, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help be part of the hospital. We're going to find that out. Other people have lives that seem to be doing better than we are. And yet, we also find this out. There will always be someone worse off than you. There will always be somebody whose problems far outweigh yours. You got a divorce. And you're broken hearted about this thing. Their spouse was killed in a car accident. Gone. You know, you, you lost a child. They lost four children. You have... I think of Ken and Shelley. Somebody's a, a, a quadriplegic, but they can still use their arms. Somebody can't even use their arms. There's always somebody worse off than we are. I remember when Phil DeVrew got up here at Mother's Day weekend, and he shared a story about his wife who had eight years she wasted away from ALS. How can you get any worse than that? And yet, as they would say, they would go around and they would realize, man, still, they had a life that was better than some people's. How? I don't know how that's even possible. Somebody always has a life that's worse than yours. When we decide to carry each other's burdens, we realize, you know what? Some are better, some are worse, but you know what? We're all really a family. Here's the problem, though, in seeing the church just as a hospital. Some people view the, hospital, view the church simply as a hospital. What do you do to the hospital? How many of you have ever been to the hospital here? How many of you are still living there? You're not, right? In fact, for most of you, probably all of you, you couldn't wait to get out of that place. There are those who show up to the local church when I got a problem. Once I get it better, whoo, I can't wait to get out of this place. I'm going to go back to my life the way it is, as if we don't need this thing going forward. Which is why if we simply view the church as a hospital, it can simply be a place where broken people go to get fixed, and once they get fixed, they go away, they don't need this thing anymore. The reality is we need it. Which leads us to the next one. The next image. Okay, so first element, the first image that we're going to deal with today is a hospital. The second one. Oh, first of all, there's this one. The church is not a museum, by the way, if Timothy Keller said, said this, Tim Keller. The church is not a museum for pristine saints but a hospital ward for broken sinners. I thought that was pretty good. Here's the next one. What is that? Looks like a garden, but it's indoors. So what do we call that? It's a greenhouse, okay? It's a greenhouse. The church is like a greenhouse, okay? So, so we have a hospital, you know, it's a place where, where broken people can go and they can get the healing power of the gospel brought into their life. But also, a next one here is the church is like a greenhouse. Now, what do we mean by the greenhouse? It, it is a, it's a people, it's a place, it's a, it's a group in which we can bring the transforming power of the gospel to every person's life. Now, every little plant starts out as a little seed or a 
shoot or something small, right? It starts out as just a little baby and then it grows up. Not all plants, though, are hardy enough to go stick out anywhere, right? So, like for instance, I just put my garden in. Now, if I would have put my garden in back at the beginning of April, what would have happened to my garden? I wouldn't have a garden to take care of. I wouldn't have something for my children to go take care of. And I would miss that. The joy of watching my kids go out there and do that, I would miss that. I'm sure they would as well. I, I, I wouldn't have a garden. Why? Because those garden plants are not capable of surviving in April. They barely could survive in May. It was cold. It was crazy cold. And so we have plants that we recognize. They're small and they need to be nurtured and brought up and stuff. And so that's really what the church becomes. It becomes like a greenhouse. I'll give you a couple things. How is the church like a greenhouse? In it, things can grow no matter what go is going on outside. Things can grow no matter what is going on outside. Some of you have come from unbelievable home situations or situations that you're currently living in, lifestyle choices, whatever else, and yet the gospel can go anywhere. I've watched the gospel change life in the worst of homes. I've watched the gospel change life in the best of homes. I've watched the gospel change lives in neighborhoods, in prisons, in jails, wherever. The gospel changes lives. It does. And it doesn't matter where you're at. It can change life, a change of life there. And that's what we really believe about the gospel. But the thing is, we recognize that a church becomes, a group of people become like a, like a greenhouse in that they help, no matter what's going on, to bring it back. God is bigger than what's going on out there. God is in control no matter what it looks like God is, is, is going on out there. Things can grow no matter what's going on outside. Things that hinder growth can be controlled. This is what I think has hurt so many people when it comes to the local church. Because they think that when they come to the local church, everybody should be super friendly all the time, never say anything negative to the other person. They think that the church should be perfect. How many of you have found a perfect church yet? It's not. Remember like we said at the beginning, this place, this body is imperfectly perfect. We're perfectly imperfect. But on the other hand, we can control certain things. And why? How can we say that we control certain things? You see, in a greenhouse, if we need more light, just turn the lights on more. If they need more water, need more heat, we just turn the water, turn the heat. Whereas something that's out there in the world doesn't always get that exactly. We can keep the foreign invaders away, okay? All those bad weed seeds like dandelion seeds and all this stuff. We can keep that stuff down. We can, we can do the right things, blowing wind on them and keeping the air circular. That's what greenhouses are able to do. That's technically what this place can become. When we come together and we're treated with dignity and with kindness, not because I feel like it, but because that's what God is calling me to and that's what the Spirit is empowering me to do. That becomes like the greenhouse. Things that hinder growth can be controlled. And things that encourage growth can be maximized. Things that encourage growth, like we said, like light or sun or anything else, it can be maximized. But here's where the analogy breaks down. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, So you were just in Galatians. Turn one page over to Ephesians. Here's where the analogy goes. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. <clears throat> Paul says, okay, here he gave all these things. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists, all these things. Why? Verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I take my nice pretty plant that I've been growing in the greenhouse and giving the right amount of sunlight and the right amount of water and all those sort of things, and I take that same plant and I go right outside and I stick it outside in April. 
And all of a sudden, that plant that was thriving so well here isn't going to do so well out there. And that's what happens. A lot of people, they come to the church thinking the church is like a greenhouse. I'm going to get my training. I'm going to do all this. And I can share my faith to my, to my people in my Sunday school class because I go to them and I can tell them all about Jesus. And they're sitting there like, oh, yeah, we agree with you. And then I go to school and I go to try to share my faith. And they're like, who cares? Shut up. Don't talk about that sort of stuff. I don't want that. And we go, oh, I wasn't ready for this. You see, the perfect world of the greenhouse is not the real world. So people who say, you know what, I'm going to just go to church and I'm going to be the Christian there. That's where my life is going to be with this group of people. Unfortunately, they don't become prepared for life out there. And so it's really, even though it needs to be a hospital at times, you bet. Even though we need to be a greenhouse at times, you bet. Both of those are oftentimes very temporary things. Which leads to the bigger picture, which is the final image that I want to give you. And it is this. What does this look like? When you study that picture, what do you see? People greeting people. I see this happening here on this end over here. That's kind of gross. Right over there in that end here. I don't know if they're greeting one another with holy kisses or what. I am not advocating for that here at Frontline. I see people of all different sizes and shapes and colors and things like that. That's what I see. You see, what I see here is, is a functional family. That's what I see. You see, we talked about the, the need for a family. We talked about that from the very beginning. What does it feel like to be a part of a family? And we talked about all these different words that were there. Nobody said perfect. I heard dysfunctional. <laughs> I heard not mine. I heard things like that. But love, responsibility, commitment. Those were some things that I heard. You see, what if we really became a functional family? That same thing that we looked at in terms of the verses there. I want you to skip over back just two pages, probably in your Bible, to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. <clears throat> verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 2. Consequently, Paul says, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. If you look in almost... in every single instance of the Bible. This is talking about people who are a part of a family. People who live in the same place. They have common affinities. And sure, maybe at times there were servants or there were slaves that were part of the household. But these were people who were together, dependent on each other. That's what the household was. And Paul is right here saying, we are a part of God's family. We are family. He goes on, I'll read just another verse, you don't have to turn there, but Paul was writing to Timothy, back again in 1 Timothy 3, and he says, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these, these instructions, so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. There it is, in God's family. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Of the truth. Here's the thing that I, there was a quote that I wanted to read. It's a guy by the name of Francis Chan, maybe you've heard of him, he's kind of famous. Uh, while every individual needs to obey Jesus' call to follow, we cannot follow Jesus as individuals. The New Testament is full of commands to do this or that for one another. And there's all sorts of one another's. Bear with one another, forgive one another, serve one another. All these different things. And then he goes on to say, it is impossible to one another yourself. When I say the local church, when I say the word church, Oftentimes people think of it like a club, like a social club. It's where I come, it's where my best friends are. I get to go hang out and catch up with what happened in the previous week. The church is way more than a social club. The church is, is, is not just a building either. Here's the other thing. The church is not an option. You're a part of a family. You're a part of God's household. And the family was designed to be functioning, 
fully functioning. And so some of the things that we're supposed to do, we're supposed to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That's the Hebrews 10.24. Oops, need to go back to it. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. We spur one another on. When we come together, we encourage each other. Motivate. That word there, spur, guess what it means? You know what the word spur means? It means spur. You know what a spur is? You know what I'm talking about. That's, what it, that's the picture there. Have you been a part of a family where a family member held you accountable for something? How did you like it? Maybe not well at the time, especially if it came from somebody you didn't like. But that's part of the family's job, is to encourage, to spur one another on. How about serving one another? It's the family's job to serve one another, to be there for one another, to uplift one another, to do those things. It's, it's the family's job to train and equip one another. It's the family's job to be a functional family. I love this verse, Galatians 6, if you just go back one book there. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. <clears throat> Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Do you feel like family here at Frontline? You see, I read a quote a couple weeks ago. People don't come to church looking for a friendly church. People come to church looking for friends. That's the thing. Oh, and now here's the thing. We can't be friends with everybody. Just like we're going to talk about in future weeks. We're going to talk about this. I only have a certain limited number of connectors. I can't connect with every single person. But how can I be more intentional with the ones I got, knowing that Mike only has this many? As he admitted a couple weeks ago, right, Mike? We only have a certain number of connectors. How can I maximize the ones that I have to really act like a family? Here's one thing. I heard a quote from somebody. I heard it with my own two ears. And the person came to me, and they said, you know what, John, I don't want to grow anymore. Because I like the number of people that we have. I know these people. While I appreciated her honesty, I was really appalled by what she said. Because here's the thing. We were all a visitor at some point, right? What would have happened if the church that we say, this is my family, what would have happened if the church said to us, we're full? There's no room in the inn. Who would you be were it not for this family? What about when people are showing up? How do we interpret that? How do we look to them? Do we invite them? Do we say, hey, this is a family. Come on in. Just be part of the family. There was a uh, young lady who started to attend a church. She would walk in every Sunday, and you could tell she had a chip on her shoulder. She would walk in each Sunday. She would kind of look around and then always sit right by herself. But she had a chip on her shoulder. As time went on, there was one friend, there was one person who was sitting there. It was her and her husband, a couple kids. And they began to see this person as she would come in and she'd sit by herself each week. And so sure enough, one Sunday, they went over to her and they said, I put myself in your shoes, and I thought it might feel kind of anxious to look for a place to sit each week. So I wanted you to know that whenever you come, you have a seat with us. We will save you one. This young lady took them up on it. And she began to come, and she began to sit with them. And every week, they would save a seat. Come on in, sit, sit over by us. Little did they know that this lady, she was a full-blown lesbian. Oh, she had a big chip against the church. Why don't you sit with us? that broke through the walls and allowed this person to say, you know what? I want to be part of the church. Let me ask you this, and I'm sorry if I'm going to go just a little bit long today. Bear with me. If you invited someone 
How much would you care about how friendly Frontline Bible Church was? You bring them the very first Sunday, and you bring your friends along, and no one says a word to your friend that you brought along. How would you feel about that? What happens, how would it be different if you knew you brought your friend that day, and you had people who were dear to you, who just went a little bit out of their way to say, hey, I'm John, hey, I'm Ryan, hey, I'm Tracy, hey, I'm... I'm Daryl, I'm Denise. Nothing major, but just said, hey, glad you're here. Would you be more inclined to bring somebody to Frontline if they did that? So let me ask you this. Based on what you know about Frontline, would you bring a friend? I think that's a sobering thought that I think we need to be aware of. You see, people aren't looking for a friendly church. They're looking for friends. And God uses us like a hospital. And He uses us like a greenhouse. And He uses us like a family to not just make people feel welcome on a Sunday morning, but to change lives. I'm going to end with a poem. I hate poems, by the way. But this one was pretty good. It's called the Responsibility Poem. And I thought it was really good. So here we go. There was a most important job that needed to be done. And no reason not to do it, there was absolutely none. But in vital matters such as this, the thing you have to ask is who exactly will it be who will carry out this task? And I want you to think, frontline being a family. Well, go on. Anybody could have told you that everybody knew that this was something somebody would surely have to do. Nobody wasn't willing, anybody had the ability, but nobody believed that it was their responsibility. It seemed to be a job that anybody could have done if anybody thought that he was supposed to be the one. But since everybody recognized that anybody could, everybody took for granted that somebody would. But nobody told anybody that we are aware of that he would be in charge of seeing it was taken care of. And nobody took it on himself to follow through and do what everybody thought that somebody would do. When what everybody needed so did not get done at all. Everybody was complaining that somebody dropped the ball. Anybody then could see it was an awful crying shame and everybody looked around for somebody to blame. Have you ever wondered about Frontline Bible Church being a connecting church? What part do you play? Here's the last one. Somebody should have done the job and everybody should have. But in the end, nobody did what anybody could have. May it not be said of Frontline Bible Church that we are not a connecting church. You see, the local church A place just like this. It should be the best way to be connected. Because we've experienced the healing power of the gospel. We've experienced the growth of a greenhouse. We've experienced family. And we in turn should be able to pass that along to other people. Should. It's not often that it happens. And so here's your homework. Here's your homework. I want you to pick one person. And do at least one thing. To make someone feel connected here at Frontline. Maybe that one thing looks like a text that you're going to share with somebody. Just out of the blue, you're going to text and say, hey, you know what? I've noticed. You do this? I'll tell you, we wouldn't be who we are without it. Maybe that someone is just going to be somebody you're going to talk to right outside of here. And you, it's somebody that you've seen and you've been scared to death to walk up to them and say, hi, I am so-and-so. Maybe today you're going to do it. You're going to go up and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. I don't know what it is, whether it's today or during the week, but you're going to pick one person and just do one thing to make them feel connected here at Frontline. And then the last one is take the assessment. We had some problems last week with, uh, with, because we didn't purchase enough subscriptions for all the people that were coming in and getting it. Now we have plenty. So if you got that email last week or the letter, we want you to take that because there are gifts that God has given this body to how to serve this family and families out there. And we want to see you get used 
until you be part of the mission of what we're doing here. I don't know where you're going to go. I don't know what's next. But we really, as a church, we want to help. We want to be a family. Uh, we got some books out on the back table. It's Father's Day. We have free books for men. Now, men love books. Can I get any amens to that? I get it, okay? Men love books? Yeah, yeah. It's, they're not being read to you, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Even still, there's some excellent stuff that's out there. Go peruse the table. There's some good copies out there. If you're looking for something, maybe some encouragement, some great books. This one's called The Man in the Mirror, Solving the 24 Problems Men Face. Excellent book. Maybe you can read one chapter a year if you want to, okay? 24 years right here. However you want to do it, but there's books out there. Here's the other thing that we have. We have food. Lots of food, okay? Uh, we had an open house yesterday that was stuff left over. We had other stuff that was brought. We have, you don't even need to eat Father's Day dinner. We have so much food back there, okay? Be a family. Having something in your hand is an excellent way to connect. Be a family. I'm going to ask the band to come on up as we close in prayer. And then uh, we'll wrap it up just with a short song called The Family of God. Great song here. All right. Let's all stand as we pray. <clears throat> Father, I know I went just a little bit long today, but there were things that I wanted to say. I felt like you had laid on my heart. And so I pray, God, that we as a church would not pass the buck when it comes to really being a functional family. That we would be like that Colossians 3 family where we were holding each other accountable and loving on each other and being patient and bearing with and all those things that um, sadly churches don't always do, including this one. And so God, if there's anybody here that needs to maybe sort through maybe some pain, maybe pain that I've caused them or pain that's been caused in the church, I pray that today would be the day they get right with you. I pray that today would be the day when we commit to being that church, that family of God, that family of believers, that the world is desperately looking to see. A body in which we show we're not just designed to connect, it's possible to connect. And we want to connect with you. And so Lord, thank you for this group, my church family. It's a privilege to be here. In Jesus' name we pray. And those in agreement said, Amen. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Joined us with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. around here it's because we're a family and these folks are so near when one has a heartache we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear I'm so glad Yeah.
terribly here. I'm going to ask you to do something terribly uncomfortable. Why don't you reach around somebody next to you, put your arm around them as we sing this chorus one more time. If there's nobody next to you, just huddle over next to somebody, uh, if you, even after you have to walk. So I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined as with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. God, we thank you so much for bringing us into your family. Help us to love one another, encourage one another, and even bear with each other and uh, help each one of us with our, our sins and our life problems and and as our continual holiness unto you. We thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for all the fathers here. May you bless this day and all our fellowship with our families and our church family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus. Is this my stuff?